up in, in, in Northwest London and you've written about it before and now you've come back to NW. What is this thing about this neighborhood that you feel so strongly about? I think, um, certainly when you walk into it, you know, there's nothing probably on the surface that strikes you as particularly beautiful. Um, but maybe what's unusual about it and maybe that Danish people can relate to, as they say in America, is that I grew up effectively in, in a village. It might not look like a village, but it is very village-like. It was, it was built as a kind of uh, contemporary urban suburb. So it, what would happen was you'd build a tube stop and then the, the village would kind of follow it. And my part was in 1899 and the whole of that suburb was built in 1899 very quickly. And it kind of stretched out along the Jubilee and Metropolitan lines this way. Um, so. It's a village of people who uh, aren't really aware of their border-like context, you know. I really, I think I put a line in the book about the map of London, because when I was growing up, I really thought that I lived in the centre of London, and Oxford Street was somewhere in the suburbs that you went to, <laughs> you know, to, for Christmas presents. That was, that was all I thought that street was for. So it's interested me, that kind of realignment in your head of a city, where your part is central and important, and what's meant to be central is really kind of far off on the borders for you. Um, and then maybe it's just a matter of, of being in a place for long enough. The thing which is quite beautiful about that suburb is its layers. So uh, if you don't look properly, it just seems to you like a grubby bit of 21st century London. But if you look up, the buildings are from the 1890s and onwards. The train stations are from the 20s and 30s. The churches are sometimes medieval, going back there's a church from the 1100s in my neighborhood. So there are these layers of English life there, despite all our attempts to tear it down and reconstruct it, uh, they continue. Um, and it's my best chance of knowing somewhere fully. Now, I, I think that is true of writers, that, particularly English writers, that they're obsessively local. You've got Hardy on one side, or Nick Hornby, people who have stuck to one corner one way or another. The young Sikh is bored, his turban leaks sweat, he looks down at his father's counter where a pocket full of change is trying to add up to ten Rothmans. A cheap fan whirs pointlessly. Leah is also bored watching Michel squeeze pastries that will never please him, that will never be as good as they were in France. This is because they're made in the back of a sweet shop off Wilson Lane. Real croissants may be purchased from the organic market on a Sunday in the playground of Leah's old school. Today is Tuesday. From her new neighbours, Leah has learned that Quinton Primary is a good enough place to buy a cross on, but not a good enough place to send your children. <laughs> but if we, if we turn to Felix, who is a very sweet... I mean, actually, all the men, almost all the yeah, men... Yeah, the men are nice, that's terrible. Isn't they're it? really yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> and of all the nice men, yeah, I he's would very say... Nice. Felix is perhaps the nicest, even though he hasn't been given the easiest cards to play from his yeah. background. Will you tell yeah, us Felix a little is about very nice. he, Felix? He was based uh, quite directly on... Uh, there's a Flaubert story called A Simple Heart, which is about a, a nice girl called Felicia, who then um, dies, basically. Um, and I just, I, The thing about Flaubert, which is so striking, is that he can take very fantastically ordinary people, no? I mean, Madame Bovary is so ordinary, she's almost banal, all she does is cheat. And she's just, there's nothing interesting about her as a person, and yet you're so engaged and so um, uh, obsessed with what's to happen to her. But if I told you the story of Madame Bovary, it's a piece of gossip, you know, which one housewife tells to another, it lasts about 35 seconds. So with Flaubert, I think it, for him also it's a kind of dare, like what can I do with this material which couldn't be more suburban, which couldn't be more banal? And he worked this wonder out of it. Um, so uh, that's something I always love. Like when, when people ask me what my books are about, I, I 
sometimes take a lot of pleasure in explaining what they're about, which is basically nothing. Nothing happens in these books. Nobody does anything. It's just some people. They're just alive. They have friends. They get married. There's nothing. Nothing's going to happen of any great uh, consequence. Um, so uh, with Felix, I just wanted to see if I could make somebody and then, I guess, kill them and, and have you care about it. It's quite a difficult thing to do. In, it's not a real person. It's just a, you know, 30 pages. So you really have to put some work in to, to make anybody feel that someone's been lost. Um, you feel it. You, you did it. I, I, I was I really, really sorry it, 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 <laughs> my, to see him go. I, w I was really sorry. and It was, it was really one of my favourite bits of the book to write because it was really... Th there isn't a lot that's interesting about Felix, really, but he's so generous, he's so kind. He hasn't got any of the usual novelistic values which are more exciting, you know. That you have to be dramatic or clever or witty or Felix isn't really any of those things, he's just a good guy. Trees shaggy overhead, hedges wild over fences, every crack in the pavement, every tree root. The way the sun hits the top deck of the 98. The walls have grown taller outside the Jewish school and outside the Muslim one. The Kilburn Tavern has been repainted, shiny black with gold lettering. If he hurries, he may even get home before her. Lie down in that clean room, that good place. Pull her into his body. Start all over again, fresh. Outside the tavern, Felix spotted Ifan and Kelly eating a tray of chips at a picnic table. Both of them from his year at school, he bawled. She's still looking fine. To get a laugh, Felix high-fived Ifan, kissed Kelly on her cheek, stole a chip, and walked on like it was all one movement, a form of dance. What are you so happy about? Kelly called after him, and Felix shouted, Love, shorty, love, L-O-V-E, love, without turning around, and did his pimp roll walk and enjoyed the laughter as he disappeared smoothly round the corner. Nobody to see him collide with the grey bins out the back. Trying to find out whether uh, she's a likable person. She's a she's a sweet person in in the way that she is so insecure about what to do and how to do. But there's one thing she's extremely sure about, and that is that she does not want to have a child. Yeah, I, I mean, what interested me while I was writing this, I was having children, and, and um, you get dragged in one way or another into the kind of culture wars around children. And I began to notice something I, I don't remember from my childhood, and I don't remember certainly from my mother's generation, of a real war about this issue. If it ever comes up in an article on the internet, it'll get 700 comments of people <laughs> screaming at each other about whether or not they have children or should have children or want to have children or not going to have children. And it interested me that it becomes such a contested area. Like, why, why was it become such a violent matter? Something which had always been a private thing one way or another. But one thing is that she doesn't want to have children. Another thing is that she has a very sweet husband who not only washes her hair, but also makes love to her and is, and yeah. is in general, a good-looking, nice man, doesn't do anything wrong, yeah. and she cheats on him. I but mean, not, not by going out with other men, but by yes, taking a pill, and, and, and he, he has a great desire to have children for him. It's like his, his fate, yeah. his, his his idea of what is the future, the future is that I'm going to have children. Well, this is something else that I noticed. Like, the culture is very, uh, the popular culture is always a little behind and always cliched and always has an agenda. So if you understood the popular culture, you would believe that women are running around the world, desperately trying to have children, <laughs> pinning young men down. It's not true. It's the opposite is true. Women are running a million miles in the opposite direction, trying to work. And in fact, when you meet men, you meet a lot of very sentimental young men who want to have children, who want a wife, a proper wife who does things for him, and so it, part of a I think, did you yeah, say a proper, proper wife. wife, yeah, that's what they want. So I think partly when you're writing, you're, part of the job is always looking at the common sense or the received wisdom and asking yourself, well, is it really true? And I don't think it is really true. There had been an attempt over the summer to mix that Camden lock lot with this Caldwell lot, but Keisha Blake did not especially care for Baudelaire or Bukowski or Nick Drake, or Sonic Youth, or Joy Division, or Boys Who Look Like Girls, or vice versa, or Anne Rice, or William Burroughs, or Kafka's Metamorphosis, or CND, or Glastonbury, or The Situationist, or Breathless, or Samuel Beckett, or Andy Warhol, or a million other Camden things, 
And when Keisha brought a wonderful Moni Love 7-inch to play on Leah's hi-fi, there was something awful in the way Leah blushed and conceded it was probably okay to dance to. They had only Prince left, and he was wearing thin. For Zadie Smith, there is no topic too great, no argument too ferocious. Race, class, and gender. The societal value of art and literature. The burden of history. She has explored them all, guiding her readers towards a more nuanced understanding of our world and ourselves.